Thank you. So, uh, so glad you could join my talk. It was just working just now, but okay. Okay. Um, my talk is about lowering the cost of entry or the barriers of entry to Kubernetes. Um, because we, uh, we all like and we all love Kubernetes, but sometimes it may not be feasible to, to do so. Um, it may be organizational concerns, it may be business concerns, it may be financial concerns. Um, and this talk is a story about how we initially built a, um, a product or a service using Docker Compose. And then in the end, we still got Kubernetes because I, I kind of found a way to put it in there anyway. Um, so this is my talk. Um, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm Lasse Holger. I have a background in uh, computer science. I got my first uh, paid job as a programmer at age 13. Uh, not a reputable company, you've never heard of it, uh, but that's my first job. Um, that's me. Um, I work at Trifork as a software pilot and a cloud specialist, I think the term is. Um, so my background is in, uh, I've been working with manufacturing companies, I've been working with uh, automotive companies, financial companies uh, and health tech companies. And this last project is in the public sector. So that's my, that's my background. A little bit about me in my spare time. I like to go sailing, as you can probably tell from this uh, very, very nice picture. The next picture is not as good a resolution, but uh, it's kind of fun. I do tall ships racing, like old wooden ships. And uh, it's not one of the big ones, it's that one in the... Uh, so, and it's quite pixelated. So it's like those 10 pixels, that's my ship. Um, and then besides that, I also, uh, oops, I play in a band. Uh, and actually we have some shows coming up Friday and Saturday in Jutland. So if you're on those parts of in the world, uh, please check us out. Um, so, and a, a bit of an agenda for today. First, we'll take a look at Docker Compose and, and give you a broad intro to the, to the project. Um, so Docker Compose and then Echo done. Yes, good. Uh, then we'll, take a look at some of the issues or unfortunate uh, aspects of the uh, of the Docker Compose solution. We'll take a look at like, is there anything we can do that's better that we actually also afford? And then step four, install K3S. And uh, here we'll do a, a light demo and then we'll finish off with like some closing words. Um, not really a fan of this clicker. Anyway, um, maybe if I do this. So, Docker Compose, that's the first thing. Uh, so the, the project, uh, to give you an intro, was supposed to be in a small team. So we had like uh, two front-end developers, like uh, one and a half FTE. We had two back-end developers, one and a half FTE, and I was doing half back-end and also doing architecting and you know, talking to the customer, uh, gathering requirements, all those things. Um, click. Uh, we had a limited budget. It was supposed to be a, a proof of concept, so we we didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of money. We had an extremely short deadline. There was a uh, requirement from the from the customer that we wanted to go really really fast, and it was a proof of concept. Like, can this be done? Is this going to solve our uh, business concerns for us? And let's evaluate after we've done the first few things in production, and then see. Should we shut it down or should we just keep going? It was also supposed to be on premises in Denmark due to regulatory issues. So I couldn't just pick any cloud and run it there. Damn it. Um, and within the team, we had limited Kubernetes experience. I had a lot because I was coming off another project where you had all the tools with all the bells and whistles. So that was, you know, uh, Kubernetes, AWS, GitOps, uh, Terraform, whatever, what have you signed Docker images, all of those things. So I know what was available from the toolbox, but I also know that I was the only one who actually knew how to use the toolbox. Um, so, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. So with that, yes, uh, short, uh, short deadline, limited budget, not a lot of uh, knowledge on Kubernetes. So like any good engineer, I did what we all do. I said, we'll make it work, we'll do it. No problem at all. So we had some some goals because this was when COVID was just starting out, and I was thinking, okay, what we're building is a, a 
video solution, video chat solution for a public entity in Denmark, and COVID is just taking off. So there is a possibility that maybe we'll get more users in a short amount of time. So I had the goal that we wanted this to be scalable, but we also had a constraint that was the budget. So we only had so much money to spend on hosting. I also wanted uh, some simplicity, and that was really related to the developer experience, the other team, the other guys on the team, that I didn't want to have a huge setup for them to uh, get accustomed to before they could be efficient. And they all knew basically Docker. So um, I, all, yeah, I had this uh, goal of simplicity. Uh, again, limited experience with Kubernetes. And then the time constraint, I'll put that as time to market. We wanted to go really, really fast here, really fast. Uh, but it had to be on-premises. So yeah, ordering a VM, or, yeah, all of those things. Uh, and some of you with a uh, project management background will recognize this as like the project manager uh, triangle. Like we had a scope that was so-and-so, we had a cost that was so-and-so, we had a time that was really, really constrained and that we had to find some quality in there. So as I said, uh, Kubernetes doesn't always make sense, unfortunately, because I love it. Um, and that could be due to the cost. Like if you're running Kubernetes in a virtual environment in the cloud, like to do um, highly available, you need at least three worker nodes and you need at least three um, uh, control nodes. So that's six VMs just to get it running. Right? I, I can't afford six VMs, who can? Um, so that may be an factor. Also the size of the project, like, uh, does it really make sense for us to run Kubernetes on a project that's supposed to be shut down uh, after the proof of concept? Well, maybe not. There's also the organizational complexity that I alluded to with, uh, yeah, the, the skill level in the team. Like we wanna have to T-shape people, but uh, if I'm the only one with the deep knowledge of, of Kubernetes, that may be a problem. Also, uh, who's going to, to maintain this afterwards? And it may be in other organizations, not in mine, but in other organizations, it may be difficult getting buy-in from, uh, from the stakeholders. Like we can't just run Kubernetes. It's, we need you know, processes and then contracts and whatever. Um, so in the end, we went for a Docker Compose setup and the architecture diagram that I came up with was this. So on the left-hand side, we had a load balancer. That is not my concern. Inside we run, uh, a virtual machine, and inside that we have Docker. And Docker runs a reverse proxy, we have some shared, uh, shared cache in Redis, we have a few services, we have a message queue. And then the, the important thing here is that, that uh, lock collection or storage of locks um, is outside of Docker. So we need a way to get those to Humio uh, and we used Fluentd for that to, to scrape the Docker logs. And then we used uh, Prometheus inside of Docker Compose along with metric beats to ship those uh, metrics over to Humio so we can actually have dashboards and have some observability. And Postgres was also handled outside of it. So this was the setup that we, that we went for. Uh, that was uh, like the, from the application perspective. So uh, we split staging and production on two VMs. One was twice the size of the other. Uh, two cores and four gigabyte of RAM. So very, very small. Uh, the only way to do that was to, to limit the number of, of places that it was say Java on this one. Um, so I think I had two services in Java and they spent like all the memory combined of all the other services. So minimize the Java. Um, we kept the desired state in, in Git. So a Docker compose file uh, instrumented with the different uh, environment variables that were kept in Git. Um, Secrets were kept on an encrypted partition uh, and mounted into the containers, the running containers as, uh, as volumes. And the deployment just SSH to a jump host and then onto the server and do Docker Compose up dash D. That's, uh, that's the deployment. So this is fairly simple. Um, and it was good user experience for the developers. They had the same Docker Compose set up on their machine. They just ran Docker Compose up and we had a a somewhat good uh, parity with, with uh, staging and production on their local machines. And like this is Docker Compose, I hope you all know it. You define a service, then you define um, the name of the service, what ports does it expose, 
what volumes does it need to have? And that's where we put in the secrets. And then does it link to a front-end service or a back-end service? In this case, it links to Redis. And then we define some volumes outside. Um, so that's good. So this is like rounding off the, the act one. So we went into production successfully in like six weeks with this. Um, and we, uh, we ran this, this experiment or proof of concept successfully for nine months without any incident. Uh, and this was like the production server had two cores and four gigs of RAM and we could successfully run the proof of concept. So that's a success. Great, we delivered on the, we delivered on the uh, deadline. Um, bah, 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 bah. Yeah, we delivered on the deadline and we managed to get everything up and running. We st uh, stayed within the budget, everything is cool. Good. So, act two, trouble in paradise. Because as the pandemic was kicking off, we had more COVID, like in the general population, which mean, meant that we would have more users of our platform and we would need better observability of what the platform is actually doing, um, was my takeaway. And, and I don't know if you've tried to do this, but uh, configuring these kind of off the shelf tools in Docker Compose, I think it's not as nice as for instance, using Helm. So I think that was a pain. And I have an example of like, I'm configuring a service that's going to do log shipping, but that's not really <laughs> what I'm passionate about. It does not really solve anything for me other than doing log shipping. And now I need to, to, to know that configuration language. So I think configuration of, of the tools, uh, off the shelf tools was a pain for me. Deployment took a lot of manual work. Um, we couldn't do rolling upgrades really, because that's not really something that you can do easily with Docker Compose. So that, that meant that I had to stay up late and do deployments because we couldn't do it during business hours. And uh, crucially, the secrets were also managed manually and separately from the services, which was a pain. Like, I'm ready to deploy my new version of my service, blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, fuck, I forgot I needed to do, uh, I needed to push in a new secret or something like that. So that was uh, a bit annoying. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a Fluent D configuration language. Uh, it's just a lot of garbage. Like, like the five things that I cared about were the five that said environment variable, and then the other thing I didn't really care about. And I was like supposed to, to, <laughs> to set this up and get it running, uh, and it was supposed to be, go inside this uh, Docker Compose uh, file, which was like tangibly related to my application services. Like it was, I think it was becoming a mess. Um, and there are, it's not to say that you can't do this in Docker. People have done it. Uh, Stefan Prodan, uh, great, great guy um, from Weaveworks, I believe. Uh, one of the, my, the primary authors of Flux as well. He has this project DocProm, uh, Doc where he sets up Docker, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, those kind of things in Docker. So it can definitely be done, but it's not like, I wouldn't say it's a good experience. That's one pr problem. And the next thing is, if you, uh, this is alluding to the manual de steps uh, for deployment. So I needed to SSH into a machine, then jump to that next machine and do Docker Compose up and then hope everything works. Um, and, and I really like the, the Google SRE book, the Site Reli Reliability Engineering book. So, and it says, if a human operator needs to touch your system during normal operations, you have a bug. The definition of normal changes uh, as your system grows. So um, at the beginning, it was okay for us to do some manual steps, but uh, over time, all of those manual steps just became toil or the manual steps that just took away my life energy. Um, so we need to, to reduce that toil to keep uh, me and the customer happy. Um, so. The things that I wanted to solve here was I wanted to have a simpler way of deploying. Uh, I didn't want to have that uh, SSH, SSH, Docker Compose up, and oh, remember to do the secrets. Um, I wanted to have better configuration of these these common tools like I've seen with Helm. Um, and I wanted better, better secrets management. And I wanted the secrets to be in the same place as my, uh, as my application configuration. So like, okay, that's the goal. Is there anything we can do? Can we afford it uh, crucially? So initially we looked at uh, going for a full-blown Kubernetes setup. So we evaluated Rancher, 
And it had the same problems as, as I mentioned with the cloud. You know, the three worker nodes, and you need the three control nodes. And it's like uh, I'm I'm six doubling my hosting cost. I can't really go back to the business and say you need to pay six times as more, uh, six times as much money now, because uh, I don't like to do manual stuff. Uh, that's <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, so that was we we took a, a serious look at it, but we we uh, decided against it in the end. Instead, we looked at something called K3S. And K3S is a project uh, by Rancher. Uh, I think it was called Rancher Labs. Now it's just called Rancher, I guess. Uh, it, is, it is a certified Kubernetes distribution. Uh, it's now a CNCF sandbox, sandbox project. And it has some uh, design choices that makes it easier to deploy and run and manage than full-blown Kubernetes. So it has an embedded SQLite database instead of etcd. It has a single binary that can run on a single VM, and it is so small that you can actually run it on a Raspberry Pi if you want to. Uh, so, like the memory footprint is like 40 megabytes for a Kubernetes distribution. 40 megabytes. That's that's really good in my uh, um, in my book. It's really really simple to set up. Uh, I will show you in a live demo in a minute, and it generates these uh, system D scripts or init RC uh, scripts, so it can actually survive a reboot and those kind of things that you want. And it runs by default container D as a con container runtime engine underneath. You can also do Docker Compose, uh, Docker, uh, sorry. Uh, but by default, it runs container D, which is, uh, again, smaller and simpler than, than full blown Docker. And it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a daemon, which is kind of nice. Um, then it comes with, uh, with, uh, suffix, uh, software called traffic as the, uh, as the ingress controller. So getting traffic into the cluster is handled by traffic. This is the architecture diagram of a K3S cluster. So the, the one thing I want you to notice here that uh, this, uh, the dotted line is a process that, that defines a process, and that process runs both the kubelet and the kube proxy and flannel. Flannel is the networking uh, stack, and it also runs the a, a tunnel proxy so it can talk to other uh, servers or agents, as they're called. Um, and then the kubelet, much as in the uh, full-scale Kubernetes, it talks to uh, the container runtime and schedules uh, the workloads on the worker nodes. So that's like, and all this uh, in, within the dotted line fits in, in 40 megs of RAM, which is kind of nice and uh, super simple to set up. Um, yeah, and we're not fooling ourselves here. We know that <laughs> just replacing Docker Compose with K3S is not going to give us highly available software. We still just have the one VM. We don't have any replicated VMs like that. Uh, we can't do zero downtime to uh, cluster upgrades. We need to take the cluster offline and then take it online when we're doing upgrades. Like that's something you can do in full-blown Kubernetes. You can update the worker nodes one at a time. We can't do that here because we just have the one VM. Um, and then we, we uh, for the same reason, we can't do cluster auto scaling, so we can't increase the number of workloads, uh, worker nodes, uh, as traffic increases. That's something we can't do. Um, but other than that, I think this is looking promising. I think I can work with this. Um, yeah. So the next thing, so this is like the infrastructure layer. We are going to go for K3S, and we're going to to um, to use that as our now uh, execution platform. The next thing we wanted to solve was the problem of these manual steps that we needed to take during deployment. And uh, I had something on my radar which was called Flux. And uh, Flux is uh, also a CNCF incubation project. It is uh, originally by, by Weaveworks, and I think they do most of the development still. Um, it has built-in support for uh, two really, really nice features, Helm and uh, Customize. Um, Helm, is, like I said, is like a... Uh, the pen, uh, package manager for cloud native deployments and customize lets you do templating and uh, configuration of those things. Uh, it has really good uh, monitoring and alerting options, so you can hook it into your Slack and it will post things when things go uh, good or go bad. Um, and I highly recommend you to take a look at these two um, repos the customize Helm example and the multi tenancy uh, example. So it actually, out of the box, uh, supports multi-tenancy. So for my project, that was not a concern. But for bigger projects, you may need it. And it can, it can definitely handle those as well. So the way Flux uh, works is that you put in some, um, you put in some sources. Can I, can I do stuff like that? Oi. 
I can do this. You put in uh, sources, and those are uh, Kubernetes CRDs, as they're called. Um, those can be um, uh, sources and customizations. They are getting put into the Kubernetes API server. So that's like the, the database. We store it in the Kubernetes API server. And then we run two things. We run a source controller, which will actually fetch the, uh, the configuration from GitHub or GitLab or uh, uh, Chart Museum, which stores Helm charts. So that will like periodically ping those servers and say, are there any new changes that I need to be aware of here? And then that will then instruct either the customized controller or the Helm controller to um, start the new deployment. So it, it pulls every minute, every 10 minutes, whatever you configure to, and then it automatically deploys those services. So it's a, it's a pull-based uh, method of deploying. And there are some namespaces or those kind of things for, for the individual tenants. Um, and there's no guy in the drawing. I'm not in that drawing. I like that. Um, yes, this is like, yeah, let's skip that one. Okay. Um, last one we wanted to, to take a look at was uh, handling secrets in a better way. And, and um, we went with something called Sealed Secrets, which is uh, built by Bitnami. And Sealed Secrets uh, works uh, like this. Inside the cluster, there's an agent running that has a public-private key. And it, it only has the private key, and you can then export the public key that's safe to store everywhere. Then you can use the public key to encrypt your secrets, and then you can just store them in Git because you don't have the, the private key. The private key is in the cluster, the public key is in Git. Uh, and once you then uh, deploy a, a sealed secret inside Kubernetes, uh, there's a, this agent that will then automatically unencrypt them and, and make them readable by, um, by the applications. So that's really, really nice. Works like this. Uh, you encrypt a secret. Uh, then you get a sealed secret out of that, and that is safe to publish everywhere. So that could put, be put in a public uh, repo if you want that. And then when you deploy it, uh, you have a, a controller inside the cluster that will then actually decrypt it, and, and you get the, the file out in the end or the data out. So this was what we were, this is what we were looking into. Um, so instead of uh, me making changes via SSH on the actual host machine, I'm now uh, down in the bottom here, I'm just making changes in Git, uh, and it will uh, Flux will automatically pull uh, Git uh, authenticated with a token, and then the do the deployments as it was. Um, Flux will make the changes to the app namespaces or to Grafana and Prometheus, whatever we have. Um, so this is what we were looking into. Crucially, we could actually fit this inside the same server. So without any resource increase uh, or any cost increase. We could run the same server, the uh, same setup, uh, but better for me and better for everybody. So that's really, really nice. Um, yeah. Now let's do a demo. Why not? Okay. So this is my uh, README. So I have three goals. I want to simplify the deployment. I want better configuration of off-the-shelf tools, and I want secret management. So. First thing we need to do is create a virtual machine. Let's pick something with two cores and four gigs of RAM. We need a, a few things here. I need to install some tools so I don't lose my mind, uh, set up some aliases, those kind of things. So that's all just prerequisites for us to get to a point where we can then install K3S. And over here, I hopefully have internet. That's the curse of the live demo, right? Uh, let's see it. Go to some website. Do the capture. Yes. Connect. Good. I think we're back. Um, so this is, I just pick Google Cloud because that's the one I know. Um, the best, anyway. So as it's uh, just booting up here, the, the thing we're going to do is take a uh, completely blank VM, install Kubernetes on it, and uh, then uh, install Flux inside that cluster, deploy sealed secrets, and see that it works. So this is my cluster, uh, not my cluster, this is my machine. And if we look at, um, 
the PS, like it's doing normal Kubernetes stuff, uh, not Kubernetes, normal Linux stuff, but there's no uh, anything running, there's no Docker, there's systemd, that's, that's about it. So now I am going to install K3S and all of the uh, security guys, you can now close your eyes. Um, so, so I'm doing what you're never supposed to do. You, uh, I'm, I'm downloading a file off the internet and just executing it straight away. I have looked inside the file, so I know that it's good. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, let's uh, see it. So now I'm uh, installing Kubernetes. Uh, so I, we started at 16.36.41. Uh, let's see how long it takes before it's, it's up and running. Um, and this is just, um, you know, it's, it's uh, setting up these uh, system D scripts and init RC scripts. It is installing a, a few tools and then it's just, uh, I think it's also installing um, container D, so now it's running. So it, that took like less than 30 seconds. Um, and I just need to figure out where is the config file so I can actually access it. I can do something like that. So I have no parts in the default namespace, that's all right. I have uh, something running. It's still booting the containers, but like the runtime is there. So now I'm actually ready to deploy something inside Kubernetes. Um, and if we do uh, watching here, so now everything is almost running and we should have uh, have a cluster here. Yeah, so it is doing stuff. Yeah, uh, let's do it another way. Uh, K9S is just a different way of looking at the Kubernetes resources and this is a more graphical way of doing it. So once all of those become blue, we are good to go, I think. <coughs> Sorry. So that was Kubernetes. We now have Kubernetes. <laughs> Hooray! Uh, I didn't have to write to uh, internal IT to get permission. I didn't have to write to my manager to get permission. Like it just download a file off the internet and then you have Kubernetes. Like how simple can it be? Um, good. Good, 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 good. And you also see that there's traffic here, so we can get uh, traffic, uh, actual HTTP traffic into the cluster. Good. Let's not do that anymore. Uh, let's uh, do another thing. Yes, good. So what I want to do now is I want to, um, I want to install Flux. And Flux comp consists of these four components that are running inside a cluster. And it has a really, really nice uh, bootstrapping script that will uh, talk to GitHub. I have put in my credentials, it will talk to GitHub, create a new repo, and commit those files to, to the repo. So let's do that. Let's bootstrap Flux, why not? And uh, you will hopefully see that it works. So it's connecting to GitHub. It created a repo for me here. Uh, and now it's doing some uh, generation. It generated some manifests, and now it's pushing those, and now it starts syncing. And now you see the blue that appeared up here, those are the Helm, uh, the Flux uh, control plane. So we have the source controller that is responsible for pulling uh, GitHub. We have a customized and Helm controller that is responsible for deploying stuff. And we have a notification controller that can then push notifications to Slack or Alert Manager or wherever you want to push them. And we're done. So we started at 36, now it's 39, uh, past the hour. So that was uh, three minutes to get Kubernetes are running, and now we have an, an automated pull-based uh, deployment situation. So that's really nice. Um, let's take a quick look at what is inside of our Git repo. Go to demo. And it just has this uh, one uh, nested uh, directory. It has something called flux system, and it has my cluster inside this uh, uh, folder. And it has all of the uh, Flux components, so that is what the bootstrap script is doing. It is deploying all of these resources into to Kubernetes. Um, maybe I should zoom a bit here. Uh, so that's that's just boilerplate, that's not important for us. Uh, what is important for us is uh, this thing here. So this is the custom resource definition that Flux uses to actually point out to GitHub, saying go over here and, uh, and fetch things. And we call this one Flux system, and it is on github.com and on the my user account and so this is the this is where we see the the difference between the source definition and then the actual deployment definition so this is saying you can fetch stuff here 
Nice. Thank you. Uh, and this is telling it, please go and deploy those things that you can find in this directory from, uh, from this Git repository, which, is, which we call Flux System. Uh, and that is all we need to actually start deploying inside of, uh, inside of uh, Kubernetes. So cool. So if we go back to uh, the first thing, we have, we have actually uh, simplified the deployment already. Um, so the next thing would be to have, uh, let's see it actually deploy something. Let's see it deploy a, a, an off-the-shelf tool. And uh, I have one uh, here, which is coincidentally sealed secrets. Uh, and I have this big thing that the, the main thing is that we're going to curl uh, something from their GitHub, which is their deployment YAML. Then we're putting it into a file right here. Uh, we are creating a file and then uh, we're ready to commit and push. So let's do that. Uh, we'll let's do it here. Yes. So let's just pause for a minute here and see uh, the deployment that we just downloaded. That's just Kubernetes YAML. That's saying, let's deploy a, uh, what is this? This is a, uh, it's a role. And then we have something else. We, let's see, we have something called a deployment in here somewhere. Uh, ah. So down here we have something that is actually the, the running executable, that's the deployment, and it's called sealed secrets controller and it lives in the cube system namespace. And um, that is basically it. I think we are almost ready to deploy. Um, so let's add this infrastructure. Uh, this is not a Git repo, what the hell? I need to clone some stuff. Uh, let me just do that. Um, so. This is now the, the operator that will be me, um, which will uh, will then uh, work with the directory. Um, so let's do that. This is in my home directory. Let's just um, okay, let's remove it. Uh, then do git clone. And I have my password in here. It's not unauthenticated. Uh, in the go to demo, we'll just do that. Uh, curl command again. So, yes. So now we have the clusters. My cluster, that's what we saw in GitHub before. And then we have the infrastructure, which uh, I've decided to call it infrastructure here. This is sealed secret. It's like a shared component in the infrastructure. Um, so that's it. And then we need to tell, um, we need to tell Flux to deploy stuff in that new directory. And we do that by creating a customization. Sorry, um, I cannot double click. Please remember. Um, creating a customization with the same source. So it's in the same directory, it's in the, oh, it's the same repo. Um, we'll synchronize it every five minutes and we'll put that file in here in the my cluster file. So let's do that. Uh, bum, bum. Yes. So now, in clusters, my cluster, I now also have something called infrastructure customization, which just say deploy stuff inside the infrastructure directory. Um, and we will need to uh, do some more stuff in uh, clusters, my clusters. I have a, a flux system, I have that. Uh, what is in flux system? Okay, let's just see how it goes. So I have uh, git add clusters, git add infrastructure. So we have three new files. Um, deploy sealed. Let's deploy sealed secrets. I'm just using a few um, um, a few sh uh, aliases. So that was just git commit and git push. Um, so now we should hopefully see Flux picking something up. Uh, to me say, yeah, so now you actually see that Flux is now deploying sealed secrets controller. Uh, so that, uh, that was uh, now uh, 45, so that's six minutes for us to, to, to deploy sealed secrets, get Kubernetes first of all, uh, deploy Flux, bootstrap Flux, install sealed secrets. Um, 
The last thing is that we want to actually, sorry, uh, encrypt uh, a sealed secret. So let me get the public key that we mentioned before out of the cluster. And I have the cube seal command here, uh, which will just fetch the cert certificate and put it in a, a PEM file. So my cluster, that's just a simple uh, certificate set to public key. And now I can actually encrypt secrets with that, um, with that uh, secret. So let's, uh, bum, 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 bum. yes, let's create a secret. So I'm creating a secret that is a literal secret, so it's just a plain text. It has a value and that is hello secret go to audience. I'm calling it my secret. I'm doing a dry run because I don't want it to actually get executed inside the cluster right now. I'm just outputting it to a, a, a secret here. And uh, those of you who know, this is not secret in any way. This is, uh, this is not secret in any way. It's just base 64 encoded. So, and encoding, that's, encoding is not encryption. I hope you all know that. So if I just do base64 decode, I get my secret back. But what we can do is we can use the cube seal CLI to then actually use the, the certificate that we just downloaded, use the secret that we outputted the, with the dry run, and put it into an encrypted secret, and we can't decode that one. That's the point. Um, so uh, we now have an encrypted secret, and it's uh, a different kind of, um, of uh, object. It's a sealed secret. It lives inside of uh, the default namespace and has a value. That's, that's basically it. Um, yeah. So let's just try that trick again. To decode it, I'm just going to get garbage out. Uh, encrypted file, didn't I call it that? Encrypted secret. Uh, inconsistency will be the death of me. Um, yes. So that was encrypted and it messes up my, uh, <laughs> my terminal. Um, let's do it again. That's encrypted. Um, so we now have a way to actually store our secrets securely inside of Git, and we can push that into Git. That would be, that would be cool. So let's uh, add the secret to Git. Let's do that. Let's make a, let's make a directory called apps, uh, and let's make it secret reader. So let's move the encrypted secret into apps uh, secret reader, and let's make a deployment that will actually read that one. So let's do this. So in apps secret reader, let's make a deployment. I can't also complete things that don't exist. Who would have thought? So it is just deploying the very, very simple uh, image here called Alpine. And the only thing it's going to do is run bin sh and echo the secret, and then it's going to sleep indefinitely. So that should uh, decrypt the secret. Uh, okay. Right crit? Yes, thank you. Uh, app secret reader. We just need to do one thing. So customize, customize, and we need to create dash auto detect. Auto detect. Yes. So now we have three files. We have deployment, we have the encrypted secret itself, and then we have the customization. And the customization is just like listing the, the resource that you want to deploy from this directory. So let's say git at apps secret reader. So we have the two new files. And we can also uh, commit the, the public key. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, and then we need to make a new customization, and it's going to uh, do almost this, but not quite. Uh, it is going to go into apps customization, and it is going to deploy. Can I do stuff like that? I cannot. Hmm. Uh, let's just do it live. It is going to deploy things from the apps, and it is going to be called apps, and it is going to be called apps here as well. So this is just, again, telling Flux, please deploy whatever files are in this directory and put it in a, a file here. Um, so cat my clusters, uh, apps customization. So pointing to, to the same Flux system uh, repo. So um, let's add clusters. Let's do this. So 
I'm now at a point where I normally would do a pull request and get some feedback from my uh, coworkers, but YOLO. Um, yes. Uh, bum, 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 bum. And Flux will pick this up very shortly. We can also force it to do it, but like it's Flux. Uh, uh, what, uh, what the fuck is it called? Not fuck. Uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, <laughs> uh, it is called Resume or Reconcile. Let's get customizations. So it hasn't synced anything yet. Oh, uh, now it's doing it. So it's now, so I could wait for it. I could also uh, do more stuff. Um, it is now running and let's just take a look at the logs. Uh, we have decrypted the secret here. So that's it. And that took 11 minutes. Um, let's go back to the slides. Um, so we had a few problems that we wanted to solve. We wanted to simplify the deployment. I think we've done that. So, Jack, uh, we want a better configuration of common tools. I just showed you plain YAML, but we can also do Helm deployments with Flux, and we can do customizations of those Helm charts. And we have also managed to, to fix this issue with, uh, with secrets management. So that's a success. Um, so where do we go from here? Of course, we can do more clusters. We can do staging and dev, and we did that in the project, so that's easy. Um, if we want to, if we are, uh, Getting close to the limit of the resources in the VM, we can of course just you know pause the VM in a cloud environment, add more resources, and then resume it, and then we have horizontally, uh, virtually scaled VM. That's awesome. We can also do multi-node K3s, so we can actually join worker nodes to it, so that becomes more highly available on the worker and the uh, yeah the workload uh, level, but not on the control level. We can also do that, uh, and we can of course move to to manage communities because everything's in Git, so it's, it's super easy to move. Um, we also have another f a lot of more tools that we're actually using in the project. So we have single sign-on for our monitoring tools using off-the-shelf, easily configurable tools. We can use, uh, we can do automatic uh, Docker upgrade based on tags. So that's automatically deploying to staging every time we build a new Docker image. We can do better uh, developer experience, losing even assume, uh, achieving live reloading using something called Tilt. We can do alerting with Alert Manager, get them in Slack. We can do validation based on the pull request. And of course, we can do uh, webhooks to, to show the deployment status inside Git or inside our uh, um, pull request. So that was my talk. Um, thank you.